This is the 10-Minute Contrarian Podcast. This is VP. We are a solutions-based podcast, diving into the world of contrarian investing and alternative finance. You can find us hosted on the No Nonsense Forex YouTube channel, nononsenseforex.com, and podcast players everywhere. Episode 162 is brought to us by Bybit. Now, how would you like to earn up to 300% APR, 300% return for your staked tether? All right, when I first heard about this, I'm like, Bybit, please tell me this isn't a real thing. That's so irresponsible, but I read further, and here's what it is. So this is only for new users, people who sign up through my link and get deposited now. Between July 1st and September 30th, if you deposit anywhere from 100 to 400 Tether, so there is a limit, and that's good, you can have up to 300% return on that tether really really awesome but you only get it if you click the link down below that takes you to the bybit blog read the blog make sure it's for you and then click the link at the very bottom of that blog get yourself deposited get those sick returns and get used to all these great promotions because as everybody else already knows with bybit membership has its rewards it is the 10 minute contrarian podcast and i still do pay pretty close attention to my podcast metrics it's just interesting to me and uh it never fails. The episodes that draw the most talk about macro and world events, and the episodes that always draw the worst are when I talk about things like copper, which is wild because this is some of the most asymmetrical upside, I think, in existence out there. Um, the only bad part for most people is you have to be even more patient than we typically are on this show. So it's, I guess it's far less appealing from that standpoint. I guess it's maybe it's just not as glamorous as gold and silver and uranium. Uh, but either way, uh, I said this a few episodes ago. We have a, a lot of new people joining us here at the podcast, so maybe you haven't heard my bull case. I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but uh, let's just say demand should be going up a lot in the coming years. Now, uh, copper, the price of copper does fall during recessions because nobody's building but after that, uh, the world, the entire world, is really, really looking to electrify. And that is not some ESG thing. That's just a necessity thing. You know, the ESG movement is hopefully dead, and that was forcing people to go this route. But it's still a sensible route for most countries to go because it breaks their dependency. Not so much on fossil fuels. They don't really care about that. But nations that produce a lot of fossil fuels... Uh, because remember, too, the global order is all but dead, and the United States is no longer protecting shipping lanes, which means some countries are just going to have to go without when it comes to certain things. And we are already seeing this across the world. But the one thing you can't really go without is energy, because as we say on the podcast all the time, energy is life. You know, less energy means less quality of life, which means if you're the leader of these countries, you are not getting reelected. Or worst case scenario, you're getting ousted somehow. And so demand is going to go up a lot for greener, more sustainable technologies that can break countries away from this dependency. Now, plus, as we said, too, there's only so many molecules to go around as far as energy goes. I've said it, too. I think there's a reason why Africa has uh, taken a very long time to develop and in many cases haven't developed at all is because the rest of the world withholds energy from that continent. It's just, it's just a fact. You know, if it wasn't a finite resource, sure, everybody can have it, but it's not. So some places have to do without, or a lot less, you know, and that's just a thing. But electrification can fix all that. And remember, too, we spoke about how birth rates are declining at a scary pace around the world. But we also said, too... That because people are living so much longer, the overall population number is going to go up for probably another 20, 30 years. So that's my long way of saying demand is going to rise a lot and supply is not, at least not of copper, which is the one metal you really, really need for all of these applications. Almost every copper mine out there is extremely old. Yeah, many are approaching the end of their mining life. And, oh, that's not a problem, VP. We can just go out and find more copper. Well, we haven't really done that. And then in a lot of these places, permitting and everything that goes around it bureaucratically can take up to 10 years before you even get started. And then smelting it is extremely 
inefficient because most countries don't want to have a smelter because it has to, it's very dirty and has to dump into a water source somewhere. So, so the whole process is just really a mess and there's no way we're going to recover from that and make it efficient and abundant any time soon. Like it could take decades. So if you're sleeping on copper stocks, you're making a huge mistake. Uh, now the whole challenge here is to time it properly, which I've always thought you know, these things are so hard to time. Just having some exposure now and sucking it up, and then if the price does drop and you would get a super discount, scoop up more or DCA down is probably the way to play this. You know, I think most of you who are listening right now who are interested in copper stocks don't have any exposure and are simply waiting till after the crash. And I just don't think that's an optimal way to go. Now, this episode, episode 162, is about something really interesting that has happened in the past month and a half or so. And I want to point this out because I think this is a very important concept to understand, especially when you're looking to the future, you know, which we're all doing here. So the spot price of copper topped out at about $5 USD back on May 27th. Now, oddly enough, I'm going to pat myself on the back here a couple times this episode, get ready for it. But I put out a tweet retweeting a CNBC article talking about how copper is the next gold. And I said, I, I just said, said one word, I said top. And I think I might have put that out right at or near the actual top. Now, I was just being silly, but I also didn't see, understand how it was that expensive. I was like, you know, what's the reason why? And the reason just wasn't a very good one. Uh, so much so, I can't even remember what it was. But anyway, the price of copper has fallen since then, all the way down to $4.11. When copper was right about $5, I remember hearing an interview with a famous trader. His name's Nick Santiago. And uh, unfortunately, he's retiring, so you can't even buy his services anymore. But uh, he has been right way more than he has been wrong. And I remember him saying that he is looking to scoop up a lot of copper exposure once the price falls to about $4.15. And almost in, in, at the time, in my mind, I'm like, oh, good luck, Nick. I don't, I don't, we may never get back down there at this point. And I was wrong about that prediction. You know, not even a month and a half later, we are already there. We're already beyond it. Uh, so that's quite a fall in a very short amount of time. Now, what do you think something like this would normally do to the price of copper stocks? Let's put it this way. If you had a 20% decline in the price of gold, so if gold were to all of a sudden drop under 2000 in a span of uh, 45 days, what do you think your gold stock portfolio would look like? Uh, you would not be loving life, let's just put it that way. However something quite interesting happened in the copper stock world. Some stocks did follow price down, but a lot of stocks did not. Some went down less, which is quite impressive, because remember, you know, when the underlying asset goes down, the stocks typically go down a lot more because it's a leverage play on the underlying asset. But instead of going down more, some of these stocks went down less. And oh, by the way, some of them just flat out broke even, didn't go down at all. And oh, by the way, some of them actually went up. So you have the underlying asset, a metal, no less, dropping almost 20%. And some of these copper mining stocks were flat to bullish. What is going on here? Now, because copper is so unloved, like we talked about before, there's very little information to even be had out there, even when you have a phenomenon like we just experienced. So what little I was able to find out is that just the performance of some of these mines is actually currently doing really well, uh, which is a bit of a departure from a lot of uh, gold and silver mining stocks, for example, to where they're all in sustaining costs or just getting higher and higher and it's eating up their profits, even though the price of the metal has gone up too. Now, also, too, most copper mines have very heavy zinc and lead offsets, which often help the price from dropping too far. Uh, compared to gold mines, for example, to where their offsets are typically copper, but they just get a lot less of it. So maybe factor this in as well. So what this tells me is that when it comes to the copper space, it's really going to be a stock picker's game at the end of the day. And 
again, don't expect there to be a whole lot of really great information out there for you. We will do the absolute best we can here at the 10-Minute Contrarian Podcast to keep you informed. Uh, But maybe picking an ETF or just picking the largest producers out there is not the move. Let's talk about the main ETF out there for copper mining stocks. And that's going to be Global X Copper Miners ETF, ticker symbol COPX. If you look at their top 10 holdings and you're really looking for true copper exposure, this just isn't it. What you are going to see is a lot of companies that I would put into the big miner category. Now, we did a whole episode a long time ago on big miners, and I think that episode will stay relevant for the next 20 years. So if you want to go back and listen to that episode, I thought it was a really good one, a really slept on episode. But those miners do produce a lot of copper, but that's not a huge percentage of their portfolio. You know, you have BHP and Rio Tinto and Tech in there, and I would never mistake those companies for uh, copper miners because they just do so many other things. And at the very top of the list, as far as allocation goes, you have First Quantum. Now, if that name sounds familiar, the, this is the company that has that gigantic mine in Panama, which has been shut down since last year due to environmental protests. You know, I don't know about you, but this just isn't the pure play copper exposure that I am looking for. So you may actually have to do your homework here. Now, a concept that I generally really like, and you guys know this because I always go crazy about it, and that's a little something called sweet divergence. And a good example of that is what we just experienced in the crypto market with Bitcoin. People all over the world who had their Bitcoin stored at Mt. Gox finally got it back, and so there's going to be some selling there. And then Germany was selling uh, most of, if not all, of the Bitcoin they had in their reserves. And it took the price of Bitcoin down a lot. Now, the question you always have to ask yourself when you see something like this is, is the price dropping for a legitimate reason or is the price dropping for a stupid reason? Very near that midterm bottom, we came out with an episode titled, Is Crypto Back on the Table? And I said, yes, it is. And you should be looking to buy because we are getting these things on sale. Because the fundamental reason for the drop just wasn't there. It was ridiculous, in fact. And I've always told you I like to buy things when they are cheap or relatively cheap. So that's one kind of divergence. You know, that's my favorite kind of divergence because let's be honest, we're all, uh, we all have a little bit of proclivity to be a discount shopper. There is a rush you get when you get something at or near the bottom or just, just cheap in general. And it, it starts to go up a lot. You know, it's a very validating feeling. But you're not always going to get that. And this is okay. I don't even know what you would call what we just saw if I was going to put a title on it. I don't want to be lazy and call it sour diversions. But So what we saw is a legitimate reason for mining stocks to fall. The underlying asset fell a lot. In most cases, that's all the reason you need. But a lot of the mining stocks stayed really strong. Contrarians, this is a good sign. So to get real nerdy for just a moment, if you guys really do your homework on mining stocks, which most of you don't, you will understand something called a discount to NAV, which is hard for me to describe in a nutshell. Let's just say stocks are supposed to be performing this well price-wise. You know, might some of them be undervalued? And can we take advantage of this? You know, this is a very common thing. It's a good thing to look for in mining stocks. The one other place that you do this a lot is in an area called closed-end funds. And this is going to be in the dividend stock category. And there's so many of them, and they're so hard to tell apart, that what a lot of people do is just run some numbers and find out where the discount to NAV is. And that's how they choose which ones they want to go with. But your experienced closed-end fund traders will tell you that it's an overrated stat. A lot of times, some of the best performers out there never go at a discount to NAV. Why? Because they're always performing the way they should. And oftentimes, they're outperforming. And why would you not want a stock that can do that? 
I really hope all of this makes sense because I know this is a, a new concept to a lot of people. And again, it's not the easiest thing to describe. And by the way, I get some feedback from a, a good amount of you saying, hey, can you talk about dividend stocks more? You know, I'm really interested. Unfortunately, it's, to me, it's just not the time. We're still at the top of a market, you know, at or near it. You know, there will be absolutely be a time to talk about these things. It's just unfortunately not now. You know, as a contrarian investing podcaster, I don't want to talk about anything at the top of a market. You know, even though I just got done telling you that you don't always need to look for discounts, I still want to talk about things when there's opportunity to get them, you know, relatively cheap. But, you know, this begs the question, are stocks, like, like the ones we just talked about, even though their price didn't drop, are they still quite cheap? And the answer often at times is yes. So uh, let's, let me give you another example. Let's just talk about uh, airlines in the United States. All right. Let's say we have a recession and the price of American airlines drops a lot because airlines always do this in recessions anyway. But let's say the price of Delta Airlines barely dropped at all. Which stock do you think I am more interested in going forward? Take a guess. The answer is actually both. It was a bit of a trick question. Airline stocks, typically, at least the bigger carriers, all go up at the same time in bull markets. So if you're going to give me a deep discount on one, sure, I'm interested. But I would also be very interested in Delta as well. Because if you are going to perform that well during a recession, during a crash, how well could a company like that perform in a bull market? Screw the discount or lack thereof, I want that stock. It's all about returns at the end of the day, not my ego. So the main thing I want to pass on to all of you in this episode, uh, it doesn't even have anything to do with copper, really. You know, it's more this concept. The copper market is just a really good example because it really encompasses everything we're looking for. A great overall bull case. Very contrarian because most people pay no attention to this space, which is ridiculous. And I really do see a future where energy stocks are the top story of the day on most financial news outlets for a while. Uh, but again, because there's such little information out there, uh, deciding which ones to buy can be very tricky. So maybe thinking about this concept as well going forward can be helpful to a lot of you. But you know something is contrarian when even contrarians are sleeping on it. So I want you guys to do this. I have asked this of you before, and you've been really good with it, no matter what player you are listening to this podcast on. All of these episodes go to YouTube. If you have any copper exposure at all, go down in the comments section and tell us what you got. And you can even tell us why. You don't have to, but it'd be nice if you did. And this podcast goes out to anywhere from six to 10,000 people a week across all platforms, all depending on what I'm talking about. Let's see if we can even get five people to respond with their copper stocks. And big miners don't count, by the way. I already know a lot of you are sitting on BHP and Rio and Vale and Glencore and all those guys. Pure copper plays. What do you got? And tell the truth. But it's not going to be a lot of you because even inside of contrarian land, holding copper stocks, especially now, seems a bit crazy. But we are not crazy. We are just early. <laughs>